Good afternoon, Her Excellency Penny Williams, Australia's Ambassador to Indonesia, board members of the Australia Indonesia Institute, members of the AEF Council, panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, joining us from around Australia and Indonesia. Selamat siang dari Jakarta, Indonesia. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Welcome to this event on the rationale why Indonesia matters in our schools an event to launch this publication developed by Asia Education Foundation for the Australia Indonesia Institute. My name is Nurfitra Asa, and I will be your MC today. Saya juga ingin mengucapkan selamat datang kepada para hadirin yang bergabung dari Indonesia. This is a special um, and somewhat historic moment for Indonesian language and studies in Australian schools. The release of this rationale, which has sought to articulate the messages stories and significance of Australia's deep connections with Indonesia to inspire schools and educators everywhere to recognize and amplify our engagement. In addition, the launch of the rationale today coincides with Hari Sumpah Pemuda or Youth Pledge Day that is commemorated across Indonesia. As you may be aware of, um, there are three pledges in Sumpah Pemuda uh, with the third being, we the sons and daughters of Indonesia uphold the language of unity, Bahasa Indonesia. As this event occurs across many lands, I'd like to invite my colleague Jessica Stevens to provide an acknowledgement of country. To Jessica. Thanks, Asa. In the spirit of reconciliation, AEF respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, sea and community. I myself am joining you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, which just so happens is where the AEF happens to be located. As you can see in this map, Australia is made up from diverse Indigenous nations. You can also see that this diversity extends to the Indonesia map above. Today, I would like to respectfully acknowledge any elders, past, present and emerging that are joining us today, not only from the lands of which I'm joining you from, but for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Jessica. Today's event brings several voices and experiences together in recognition of the outcome of, this, of the rationale on why Indonesia matters in our schools. It now gives me a great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Penny Williams, Australia's ambassador to Indonesia, to provide some remarks on the rationale and her own story of her connection with Indonesia. Uh, but before that, here's a short video of Her Excellency that was created for her and for her recent credentialing, marking the official start of her posting for Indonesia. Hello, saya Penny Williams, Duda Besar Australia untuk Indonesia. Walaupun saya sudah berada di Jakarta selama beberapa bulan, saya sangat senang sekali dapat memulai tugas saya di Indonesia secara resmi. Saya berasal dari Tasmania, sebuah pulau di Australia yang terletak paling jauh dari Indonesia, Namun, hubungan saya dengan Indonesia dekat sekali. 40 tahun yang lalu, saya mengikuti program pertukaran pelajar di Jakarta. Saya tinggal bersama keluarga Indonesia selama satu tahun dan bersekolah di kelas 2 SMA. Makanya sekarang saya merasa seperti pulang kampung. Saya tahu saat ini adalah masa yang sangat sulit karena COVID-19, baik itu di Indonesia maupun di Australia. Australia dan Indonesia bekerja sama dalam menghadapi dan mengatasi pandemi ini. Saya berkomitmen untuk semakin mempererat hubungan antar masyarakat kedua negara dan membangun hubungan ekonomi yang lebih kuat untuk kemakmuran bersama. Terus ikuti akun media sosial Kedubes Australia agar kita tetap terhubung dan jangan lupa untuk meninggalkan komen di bawah ini. Terima kasih untuk sambutan yang hangat, Indonesia. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you today to launch this rationale while Indonesia matters in our schools. It really is a huge honour and a great pleasure. I want to congratulate the whole team at the Asia Education Foundation 
for preparing the rationale and also for your commitment to its implementation. As you can see from that video, uh, it's a subject very dear to my heart, not just because I'm currently Australia's ambassador to Indonesia, but because I've been a student of Indonesia and Indonesian language for a very long time. Actually, that video talks about me coming to Indonesia 40 years ago as an exchange student, which really was a life-changing experience. And quite sort of strangely, I actually lived, I'm sitting in the residence at the moment, the ambassador's residence. I actually lived around the corner and I was uh, at a class dua, SMA, SMA satu, uh, in Jalan de Ponegoro. And it really was a life changing experience for me. But it actually wasn't my first visit to Indonesia and the educationalists among you will kind of get how these things through life just link together. I'm actually from Tasmania and my mother's a teacher. Um, and in the 70s, uh, a friend of hers was an Australian volunteer abroad. He was an English teacher and he came to Bandung actually to teach English in Bandung. And my mother picked us all up from Tasmania and decided that we were going to go and visit him. So we flew to Bali and then we caught the train across to Georgia. Um, that was a life changing moment for me just because I'd never been outside Australia and to go somewhere like Indonesia was amazing. But also uh, when I went on to choose my subjects for year 11 and 12, I was pretty intent on not doing maths. And in Tasmania back in the day, if you didn't do maths, you had to do a language. Uh, so what language did I choose? My mum's friend who was a teacher uh, was a teacher at my school, that's Tasmania for you, and he suggested that I choose Indonesian, not Italian, and that had some resonance for me because of that experience that I had in primary school of coming to Indonesia. And then uh, after a year, I was uh, lucky to be selected to participate as an exchange student in Indonesia. Indonesia and Australia seemed a very long way away from each other back in, back in the day. Um, and as I said, it really did change my life in terms of understanding something, the feel of a country that only comes through really being immersed in language and that kind of sense of just going to bed every night kind of with Indonesian words kind of flickering into my head. Um, since I've been here, uh, people do comment sometimes I sound less like an ambassador and more like a 16 year old who's kind of going hanging around block M, but I guess that's the language that, that I learned. But my experience in Indonesia as an exchange student meant that I was absolutely hooked. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I did know that I wanted to keep studying Indonesian. So on return to Australia, I uh, sought out a university with a strong Indonesian language program and moved to the mainland and uh, decided to study at ANU uh, where I uh, studied Asian Studies and Bahasa Indonesia. And I can say that the ability to speak and understand the Indonesian language was just as important uh, to my ability to connect with the culture and people of Indonesia back then as a student as it is today in my role as ambassador with the largest Australian embassy overseas in terms of our numbers of staff and strap, in fact, strong Indonesian language skills. And that goes to the importance of the bilateral relationship, obviously, and the depth and breadth of it. But strong Indonesian language skills are fundamental to the work that the embassy does. Just over the last couple of days, I've kind of touched base with a couple of colleagues. We've got lots of fantastic Indonesian speakers. Uh, across the embassy, but I just touch base with a couple to give you a sense of their uh, their experiences. Brigadier General Justin Rookie, he's the head of our uh, uh, Australian Defence Staff in Indonesia. He's another fluent Indonesian speaker in the embassy. He first studied Indonesian language at ADFA in the 1990s, and he's lived and worked, including staff training college in Indonesia, for almost 11 years on the run. He sings in Indonesia. Uh, often called on at military events and he also sings in Javanese, he's got a few of those down as well. And watching how defence ensure that they've got those Indonesian language skills is pretty impressive. Um, Justin told me that uh, that high level of Indonesian language ability across both informal and formal language is immensely valuable to his work. It's a difference between, he told me, understanding not just being what is being said, but the cultural and linguistic nuance that explain what is meant by what is being said. Amelia Fifefield, who's our CSIRO country manager for Indonesia, doing a lot of work in plastics and pollution, also an ANU Indonesian graduate, another fluent Indonesian speaker, tells me that 
speaking Indonesian well means that she can walk into a meeting room and immediately demonstrate the respect that is so fundamental to strong working relationships. So, of course, we at the embassy understand the value of the Indonesian language and the importance of encouraging more young Australians to learn about our nearest neighbour. Indonesia, as the rationale highlights, is on track to be the fifth largest economy in the world by 2030. And Bahasa Indonesia, the mother the tongue of our neighbour, will then be spoken by almost 300 million people, making it the sixth most spoken language in the world. Data really does tell a story, doesn't it? But while it's true that increasing understanding and awareness of Indonesia presents an immense opportunity in the future, it also presents an opportunity right now. The fact is, right now, Australia and Indonesia are working together across more areas of joint interest than ever before. And immediately prior to the pandemic, levels of direct people-to-people -people engagement between our countries were at all-time highs. And I'm hoping very much in the next couple of months we can get back there. The new Colombo plan, of which many of you I know will be familiar, is a great example. Often people sort of lament people-to-people -people links and think that perhaps it's not as it was. But can I just say, it's really important to remember that Indonesia was the preferred country of choice for students leaving Australia on New Colombo Plan scholarships. In the first five years of the New Colombo Plan, 10,000 Australian students spent time in Indonesia undertaking placements here at various stages of their university careers. We've kept momentum in the program as best as we can virtually, and there's absolutely every indication that this sort of interest will persist when uh, programs, when borders are able to reopen. The Australia Indonesia Youth Exchange Program, the Bridge Program that we're going to hear a bit more about today, the Australia Indonesia Muslim Exchange Program, the Australian Consortium for In Country Indonesian Studies. These are all programs that we've supported virtually throughout this period, which will be at the forefront of re engaging our people to people connections. And importantly, these programs are focused on young people, engaging young Australians and young Indonesians and building friendships and mutual understanding. Indonesian students continue to see Australia as a priority destination for study and investment. And before the pandemic, we had around 20,000 Indonesian students enrolled in Australian universities. And once again, we've got every reason to believe this level of demand will continue to, as borders reopen, the other thing that we've seen is with the opening of the Monash campus here and interest on the part of other Australian education providers for different sorts of engagement with uh, Indonesia. Some of that's about bricks and mortar like Monash, but some of it's about different kinds of partnerships with educational institutions uh, uh, in Indonesia, which gives access to a broader group of Indonesian students to some experience of Australian education. Before the pandemic, of course, Tourism too was a bright spot. Um, Australians chose Indonesia second only to New Zealand when considering overseas travel in 2019. And this, of course, much of this travel reflects Australia's love affair with Bali. Just once again, data says a lot, 1.3 million Australians visit Bali every year out of our population, that's pretty impressive. But we're also seeing more and more Australians venture further for travel and business. So beyond our direct people-to-people -people links, our cooperation, as I said, does extend more broadly than ever before. Indonesian technology companies are looking for Australian talent. They need to take their companies global. Australian companies are continuing to find new markets for goods, for services, support for, support for new business ideas. Our defence forces are continuing to deepen their cooperation. And at a political level, I can say, our governments have been working more closely together than ever, including to respond to the extraordinary challenges COVID has presented for Australia, Indonesia and for the region. So we've got a, an immense opportunity right now and into the future to explore new ways of working with Indonesia and to have to new benefits from deeper cooperation. I really do hope that this rationale provides a building block for a new generation of Australians to recognise these opportunities and to generate new opportunities into the future. Once again, can I commend you on this rationale? I've been so pleased once again to be invited to join you this morning. 
And I do very much look forward to working with you all closely as we take this work forward. Thank you very much. Terima kasih banyak, Your Excellency, for your insights, stories, and those wonderful and encouraging words. I now welcome our Executive Director at AEF, Hamish Curry, to provide a brief overview of the rationale. We'll also hear briefly from Mira Sulistianto, Clarice Campbell, and Gian Chandaputra about their engagement in the Australia-Indonesia space. Terima kasih, Asa. This rationale comes at a crucial time. It was recommended over a decade ago in a report also released by AEF, but perhaps at a time when we wondered that there was much to worry about. But like climate change, the gradual decline of students learning Indonesian, as well as the availability of proficient teachers, has made the call of this rationale all the more urgent. Since January this year, AEF has been planning, reviewing, and consulting widely around this initiative made possible through the support of the Australia Indonesia Institute. Bringing comprehensive stories, surveys, interviews and data together has been a challenging process. Today, we released the rationale we've crafted from that work into a concise and informative document, coupled with striking imagery, all in only six pages. You can all access the rationale via a link in the chat that we'll be putting in now. These pages are intended for school leaders and teachers and those in government, policy, and jurisdictions of education to better understand why Indonesian language and studies should be reinforced and better supported in schools. This rationale is not targeted at students. We quickly realized that this would be a very different undertaking and no rationale could appeal equally to all stakeholders. To be clear, this is not a report this is not a research paper. It is a rationale answering a bigger question for those who need to better understand the value and role of Indonesia in our schools. We'll be circulating this rationale as widely as we can to ensure these messages are heard, and we encourage all of you to do the same. From many of the voices, we heard three key words repeated time and again. Proximity, communication, and contemporary. For education, we want to get across key messages that remind us of the value in having Indonesia as our neighbour. Two, we must do better in communication. Three, Indonesia is not what you think it is. We cannot afford to waste this opportunity. I know many of our attendees today have spent their careers advocating, energizing, and teaching about the stories, the dynamism, and the intercultural connections between Indonesia and Australia. But the momentum has been hard to sustain, and there are clear signs of declining engagement in education. That's why we want this rationale to convert more advocates and more leaders in education, policy, and government in recognizing and acting on the need to engage in more Indonesian languages studies in Australian education. What we needed was some clearer messages why. Ones from a place of optimism, positivity, and great potential. Through our work, we refined these down to four themes that we share as nations. That Indonesia matters in our schools because it's our neighbor and our future. It's about our learning and our language. It's about our creativity and our cultures. And finally, it's about our environment and our sustainability. To bring these messages to life today, we've invited three young professionals to share some stories with you who've had their lives transformed through Australia-Indonesia engagement. First, I'd like to welcome Mira Silistianto, a graduate at Tetra Tech International. Thanks, Hamish. I'm really pleased to be here today discussing a matter so close to my heart, and I do truly thank the Asia Education Foundation and the Australian Indonesia Institute for the opportunity to share remarks today. I, um, I had the privilege, of course, of being exposed to Indonesian language from birth, but growing up and schooling outside Indonesia meant that I really didn't have the opportunity to study it 
formally uh, until until high school began. Uh, and it was there that I was first exposed to a whole scores of students um, with no prior connection to Indonesia who were nonetheless interested in learning its language. And as a teenager, that was really fascinating to me to see this. And I continued and do continue to see that in young Australians um, through high school and through university. I'd like to particularly acknowledge Dr. Michelle Kohler, um, who's on the line today and who was one of the supportive and influential Indonesian students, uh, teachers that I had during my time at uni. But I can't understate the direct impact that this formal language learning has had on me as an individual and how deeply I cherish the tight knit network of peers that I've gained through it. At the very personal level, language learning allowed me to significantly strengthen my connections to my own heritage, culture, extended family, and even with my own father. But studying Indonesian, of course, also exposed me to countless professional opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise had, including being one of the many students that Her Excellency Penny Williams mentioned um, undertook an 18 month New Colombo Plan scholarship and a, a teacher student exchange uh, program, but also undertaking internships with non-government organizations, research centers, diplomatic posts in Java and in Sulawesi, joining visual arts exhibitions, volunteering with the Australia Indonesia Youth Association and the Conference of Australian and Indonesian Youth. And now um, becoming a, a graduate consultant in the international development aid and diplomacy sector. And so of course, as you all know how these things happen, my peers, that community of young Australians who have fallen into Indonesian studies over the years has expanded exponentially. I've seen that um, scores of them are on the line uh, today even, so it's great to see everybody. <laughs> and it's the, the passion and, and drive of this community that is really astounding. And I can unequivocally say that those who have truly thrived in this space, not just survived, were those who studied language. People who dove that bit deeper were able to connect better and flourish a lot more thanks to the greater diversity of opportunities across all sectors and across Australia and in the archipelago. So thanks very much, Hamish, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mira. Next. I'd like to welcome Clarice Campbell, National President of the Australia Indonesia Youth Association. Thanks Hamish and thanks to the AEF and AAI for inviting me today to say a few words. Um, I am the National President of the Australia Indonesia Youth Association and I'm also the Lead Advisor for Skills for the IASEPA ECP Catalyst Program. Uh, so I'm an Australian living in Indonesia and I just want to start out by saying that Studying Indonesian has truly changed my life. <laughs> um, I would not be working in the bilateral relationship, have had or even taken the opportunity to move to Indonesia had I not studied Indonesian when I was young. Prior to taking Indonesian classes at Williamstown High School in Victoria, I had no personal connection to the country. I don't have Indonesian heritage and had never been to Indonesia. So it was really by chance that I was sort of brought into this world and it was thanks to being able to study Indonesian at school. In primary school, I had been swapped between various language classes. I studied Mandarin, Italian, Japanese, but it wasn't until I ended up in Indonesian class in year seven that I really realized my love for studying languages and for Indonesia. I kept it up throughout high school until year 12 and while my Indonesian at the time was pretty average, uh, it opened up doors that I actually never imagined. Uh, after completing my VCE, I went to study an Indonesian major at Monash University and a shout out to some of my Indonesian lecturers who are on the line. I can see Paul Thomas is here and Howie Manns and Yusinta Kroniasi was also a really big influence. Um, and they just sparked my passion for getting involved in everything Indonesia related. You couldn't find me at uh, an Indonesian, you couldn't find an Indonesian event in Melbourne that I wasn't at. And there are a couple of people on the line who can attest to that, like Gian and Asa. <laughs> 
Um, so after I completed uh, my degree, I, I, I did an honours year as well in Indonesian linguistics. But it gave me the opportunity to actually move to Jakarta. Um, and since then, I essentially haven't looked back. I now have the opportunity to make meaningful change in the bilateral relationship by leading AYA, which provides opportunities for young Australians and Indonesians to engage with one another, and also to work on implementing the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, a program which is honestly an honour for me to be a part of. So without uh, Indonesian in schools around Australia, other Aussie kids like me wouldn't have had a reason to look at our neighbour other than for going on a holiday, but the economic and social opportunities I have personally experienced because I committed to learning more about Indonesia is unexplainable. <laughs> so, you know, I plead to anyone listening uh, on this call who has influence in terms of whether your school can start offering Indonesian or continue to offer Indonesian, just to do so because I believe it will change someone's life for the better and build crucial connections between our two countries. So I really thank the AEF for creating this rationale. Um, I think it's really needed and hopefully we can see a new generation of young Australians who invest in learning about Indonesia. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Clarice. Finally, I'd like to welcome Jan Jandaputra, former engagement coordinator at the Australia Indonesia Centre and now a senior consultant in business transformation at Ernst & Young Australia. Welcome, Gyan. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, Selamat sore and selamat siang, everyone. Uh, so I'm the opposite of Clarice. I am an Indonesian who has been in Australia. So I came to Australia, to Melbourne over 12 years ago uh, to study politics at Monash University. And I've been lucky enough that I've spent most of that time since uh, focusing on the work to strengthen the bilateral relationship through the Australia Indonesia Centre, through the AYA, the Youth Association, the Young Leaders for Kozindi, and I even played a little hand in um, forming a community of Australians and Indonesians uh, committed to AFL football. So if there's one thing that I've learned over that time, it's that the, to me, the strongest bonds were formed through uh, shared experiences. And the most memorable experiences are the ones who embraced uh, and chased our respective culture. Yeah, there's a reason why I love footy so much. Uh, I will never forget the time when I hosted a group of Indonesian diplomats to a game of primetime AFL football at the Melbourne Cricket Ground between Richmond and Essendon with a crowd of 60 to 70,000 people. Uh, and I'll always remember the time when I listened to uh, the, the Governor General David Hurley gave a speech in Indonesian. And I'll certainly never forget the time when I uh, represented Indonesia at the AFL uh, International Cup. So the yeah the shared experiences the ones who embrace arts and culture were to be the uh, the ones who form the strongest bonds now i'm very grateful for the work of creating this rationale it it came at the most important time to me because uh, if we've learned anything over the last 20 months or so it's that now more than ever we need to be able to rely on one another to face uh, the grave challenges that we share uh, either navigating through the rest of the pandemic or the long-term challenge of climate change. So to me, if I think about why does Indonesia matter in our schools, it's because wouldn't it be great if we can rely on our neighbours as much as we can rely on our closest mates? And in fact, wouldn't it be great if our neighbours do become our closest mates? So, Thank you for this very important work, and I hope to work with you uh, in the future to continue to strengthen the important relationship between our two countries. Thank you. Beautifully said, Gian. Thank you.
Terima kasih, Hamish, Mira, Clarice, and Gian. These contexts and stories provide us with a small glimpse into the kinds of perspectives that were integrated into the finished rationale. Hamish will now pick up on our education context with a number of special guests from across education in Australia and Indonesia. As you're listening to the panel discussion, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In addition, thank you as well for those of you who have submitted questions at a time of registration. So I'm very excited for this panel discussion. But before we get into the questions, let me briefly introduce the amazing guests we've gathered for this panel. First is Dr. Michelle Collar, who's with the Research Centre for Languages and Cultures at the University of South Australia. Michelle is one of Australia's leading experts on Indonesian and education and contributed significant work to this rationale. Next, we have Principal Andrew Fitzsimons from Dapto High School in New South Wales. Andrew has been a strong leader and advocate with Indonesia through the AF Bridge program and continues to do amazing things in this space. And finally, Bapak Muhammad Sofyan, a leading school teacher from Esaman Lima, Mataram West Nusa Tenggara. Pak Sofyan has been one of our wonderful Bridge School educators, whose school is also one of our leading Lighthouse partnerships. So welcome to you all. See that we've got. Uh... Ah, wonderful. I can see you all now. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, I, I'm actually going to start with with you. Um, hopefully, you don't shed a tear in in this uh, in this wonderful moment, um, because you've argued for the need for investment in a clear rationale for Indonesian language and Australian girls for 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 some time now, uh, and, and without it sounding like too much of a trite question. Why do you think we need this rationale? Thanks, Hamish, uh, and uh, great to see everyone. Um, yes, if I do shed a tear, hopefully it's a tear of joy that we might have turned a corner because as you um, so beautifully uh, outlined earlier, uh, we have known for some time um, that there are some challenges in this space. Um, in fact, and I note, you know, so many great educators uh, that I have looked up to uh, are present with us today, and I just want to acknowledge them as well, um, uh, and our wonderful students, of course. But uh, um, you know, Paul Thomas and uh, many colleagues uh, prepared a lovely volume, Talking North, uh, on the 50 years of Indonesia in Australian education, and um, you know, we can see that over that time there have been ebbs and flows, and you know, we might expect some of that. But I guess, uh, particularly when Philip. Mankin, who's also here, uh, and myself uh, prepared the uh, 2010 report for the Commonwealth Government at the time through the Asia Education Foundation, uh, we could really see a, a, a concerning trend. And that was a, a, a trend that wasn't getting the bump back up again. And so um, I guess uh, the warning bells were there uh, and we tried to ring, ring some of those bells and it's great that the AF has been able to pick up on that. Uh, it's been ringing a long time, but um, wonderful to see that uh, we might be able to do something about it. Um, we know that uh, Indonesian is not a community language uh, in the same way that perhaps some of the other languages are in the Australian context. Um, it's not necessarily um, a sort of a prestigious language as some of our European languages and perhaps Japanese in the Asian space might be. So we don't kind of have that almost inherent um, valuing of, of, of Indonesian. And, you know, I guess part of that rationale is trying to craft that narrative around the value proposition. And we really do need uh, advocacy and support uh, through policy work, through uh, national work and uh, local work at different levels. So um, uh, I, I, I forget who it was that said it, Gian, it might have been, um, that, uh, you know, we need um, you know, we need to not just know our neighbour and know about our neighbour, but we actually need to be able to interact with our neighbour. And we need to know and share the knowledges 
of our respective uh, places and peoples. And I think for me, um, that's the values proposition here is uh, yes, uh, plenty to learn, plenty uh, of opportunity, but really this is a project, from my perspective at least, a, an educational project, one of transforming uh, the self. And if we can get that message across with what Indonesia and Indonesian uniquely offers um, young people in our education system, to me, uh, that would be a great turnaround. And that's really what this work is uh, hoping to achieve. Thank you very much, Michelle. You've, you've certainly summed up some of the history and some of the, the challenge as well as the opportunity um, that this rationale presents. And, and that is very much the spirit in which we've, we've crafted it. Uh, Pak Sofian, I'm, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, your incredible work through, through the Bridge Program. Um, we'd love for you to, love for yes. you to tell us uh, one story about your Bridge Partnership, what your school did and, and why that Bridge Partnership is important to you. Okay, thank you, Hamid. Okay, thank you for your questions uh, about uh, my story, my school, what my school have done for uh, bridge partnership. Okay, uh, I start from uh, our bridge, uh, bridge partnership was started in 2009 yeah, or about 12 years ago. So for Child of Your School, we have done many collaborative activities with our school partner in Australia, Malamimbi High School, yeah? uh, such as visit, uh, sharing information, uh, teaching, learning program. Yeah? Uh, my school, SM Ali Mataram, a student and teacher have visited Malamimbi High School five times. Yeah? Uh, the last was in 2018. Our students stay in Australian host family for uh, one month, uh, studying together in Australian classroom, uh, flying together, yes, in break time, uh, making a local handicraft. And at the end of the programs, they do cultural performance from night, etc. Uh, similarly, yeah, uh, Malambi, Malambimbi High School student and teacher have visited SMALI Mamataram three times, yeah. Uh, the last was in 2016. Even, you know, the Australian uh, ambassador to Indonesia have visited SMALI Mataram in 2014. Uh, through this call visit, both schools are connected emotionally, uh, understand each other, and care about each other. There is an uh, Indonesian proverb uh, that can express this tak kenal maka tak sayang or uh, outside out of mind. Yeah, uh, the intensive interaction and communication which comply in English and Bahasa Indonesia have tied the, the partnership until now, to 2021, and prepare both school as a role model of active global citizens. And you know, uh, since 2019, uh, both schools, yeah, Malamambi High School and my school, SM Alima Mataram, have stre stre strengthened their collaborative activity in like house uh, pro partners program, like house partnership program or LPP. Uh, LPP is a grand initiative of the bridge program to help embed the bridge partnership throughout the school, uh, share knowledge with other schools about the new practice and how to improve uh, school partnership, as well as uh, raise awareness of school partnership among stakeholders. Uh, moreover, the existence of social media in digital uh, era, especially in COVID pandemic, yeah, are utilized or used by our teacher and student from uh, both schools, a partner. Uh, we use Wiki, Wiki, Wikispace, email, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Zoom. Uh, to connect both school part, uh, to uh, to co connect both school teacher and students to share and study and discuss their uh, their collaborative activities uh, as partnership as well as personal connection. Uh, the pandemic has taught us to be more creative in using uh, this digital tool to collaborate. Yeah. Uh, 
those uh, partnership process are still going right now. Yeah, and, and we have that our bridge partnership keeping uh, keeps going on, even though the personnel in this partnership have changed or over the years or retires. Yeah, uh, become become important to me, and I hope our partnership will be sustainable. Yeah, because the benefit of this partnership for te our teacher. Yeah. Our school and the student are massive. Not only that it builds closer connections between individuals, but also enrich our teaching and uh, learning experience. Maybe that's my story, Hemis, from uh, SMA Lima Mataram about uh, our partnership, yeah, uh, that's facilitated by S Education Foundation. And we are happy to be one of school in bridge partnership. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. I think, I think uh, your story embodies something that, that I've been reflecting on that, you know, really strong school partnerships are founded on resilience, uh, relationships and resourcefulness. And I, you, you've summed up all of those characteristics uh, in your story. Thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew, I, I'm going to come to you now um, because obviously we know that there are some common challenges to offering languages in schools, like finding the right teacher. But when a school is choosing a language to teach, what kind of rationale do you think can influence that choice? Um, it's complex. Thank you very much. I'm honoured to be invited. I'm, I'm totally surprised as well as honoured. Uh, I lead DAPTO High School for the last 18 years. Um, and the question you asked, Hamish, I have a wonderful language teacher. She has an Italian heritage. She's permanent full-time. She speaks a tiny amount, a tiny bit of Indonesian. So uh, for us to, uh, and in New South Wales, all students in year seven and eight must do a hundred hours of language other than English. We teach Italian and French. Um, if you want to study Indonesian, you have to do it by distance ed. Uh, I see Ms. Crossing is here. Renee, I think you did Indonesian by distance ed and got a band six. We were amazingly proud of you. But, but it's complex. Uh, I mean, being invited has sharpened my thinking on this. Um, the AEF has been so important for DAPTO High School. We've gone to Mon Mongolia, to Bhutan, to Sarawak, to China, to Indonesia, to India. We are, we've got a program called wv at dhs a wider world view at DAPTO high school encouraging kids staff families to look over the horizon for opportunity and challenge in fact i'm a late convert indonesia is the only country that i can have a rationale for that we should be teaching it's the fact that it's a democracy the fact that it's close I'm told the language is much easier, for instance, than Chinese or Korean and so on. This won't please you. It is very, very difficult for a school like, well, for a public school, everyone is risk averse. For me to get approval, for Depto High School to get approval to travel to Indonesia is, anyway, in 2019, I, I took, I traveled with some of my staff, we were not allowed to take students to Imin College in Makassa. It was an extraordinary experience. But I remember a couple of days before we left, the risk assessment for a tsunami that was 1500 kilometers away came through and all my bosses said, Andrew, sit in the stand in the corner, you can't go. Um, I guess everyone is risk averse. Um, we have this partnership. And in fact, uh, Ms. Williams is traveling to that college, in in college uh, on Sunday. And we, we had a Zoom yesterday afternoon to renew old acquaintances. Um, but every time you look around, there's another sort of reason not to. I, as principal, I have some fine, to, you need passionate teachers to say, and they're often people who've done traveling um, like Michelle, like the, like the ambassador, the ambassador's experience is almost impossible at the moment. 
I have almost no students willing to go on exchange and arranging a, a trip to Indonesia. COVID aside, it's just very, very unlikely. Um, the whole process is cumbersome. And so that's not a good, uh, that's not a good response because it's clear. I mean, all curriculum, national curriculum has an Asian, indigenous and sustainability uh, dimensions threaded through English, maths and Latin. So we're ripe for this. One of my passionate teachers says, we need more textbooks. We can insert uh, Indonesia into lots of subjects. We need the AEF to get us funding doubled and push us harder to do that. Um, one of your questions before is, you know, how do we how do we get more schools involved? I think events like this, um, we schools get to choose, um, and I'm not even going to say this if you like, but I have quite a few of my families previously travelled to Indonesia to stay in five star hotels and shop and get their hair braided. It wasn't, there wasn't a very strong cultural engagement. I think that might be true. Um, so it feels like there's lots to do before we really understand this relationship. And as a late convert, going to Makassar was staggering, was wonderful. And the people were so good to us. Um, and we've had some teacher exchanges, but having student exchanges would really pack. I think you're saying that was valuable in your um, experience. I'm not particularly optimistic that student exchanges are going to happen soon. I could rave on, but enough. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, look, I think, I think your, your honesty and your understanding of the complexity um, uh, I'm sure things felt by, by many of us, and I think we, we always understand the challenges. Um, I also think that your comments about choice uh, and how we start to understand those choices, not just for what languages we teach, but also how we value the understanding of uh, our region. And I think you, you at DAPTO High School have been able to navigate this in, in quite a cre creative and, and persistent way um, in spite of some of the challenges. And I know that there's many opportunities to overcome those challenges together in the future. Um, I am going to um, circle back to you again, um, Michelle, uh, because I, I have another question for you that really relates to the rationale and its particular focus on, on different areas that in some degree uh, are sort of away from maybe the normal economic drivers that sometimes people associate with, with uh, learning another language. Would you care to comment on your thoughts on, on why we needed to have a rationale that sort of didn't overemphasize those economic drivers? Uh, thanks, nice easy question, <laughs> Hamish. Um, look, I, I guess I, you know, I've thought long and hard about this for a long time um, because I, you know, I'm interested in language policy and, and planning more, more broadly uh, across languages education, uh, but obviously um, uh, you know, the connection to uh, language studies and, and, and culture studies. Um, and I think you know, we really have been left a kind of legacy through communicative language teaching that um, hasn't necessarily done us any favours in the long run because there is this uh, emphasis on communication and of course we want that. Um, you know, we're talking about interacting, you've got to have communication. Um, but with, it's it's always had a kind of, uh, you know, because of the orange, orange, origins, orange, oh, origins of it, sorry about that, um, it's been, uh, tainted with or it's been through the lens of the economic and the economic gains to the individual uh, and to the nation of course and so yes again we we want that but we are talking about education here and primarily education needs to be about the transformation of the self um, and so uh, you know we we need to get back to i think uh, what are the educational values and merits of learning all languages and, and, and cultures. Um, but what are, 
the particular ones for Indonesian. And there are some incredible, as we've all uh, experienced here, some incredible values, worldviews, um, sensibilities, uh, knowledges uh, that come from engaging with Indonesia and uh, hopefully uh, reciprocally uh, as well from the Indonesian side. So, you know, it really, for me, I've, I've, I guess I've come to a position where it's really more about the nature of the learning. What is the learning proposition that we get from engaging with Indonesia? And, you know, going to, to Andrew's perspective, I would hope that principals actually uh, recognise the, the, the merit, the educational merit in that. Um, and, you know, many of the students that I've spoken to over the years have said, look, you know, it would be lovely, maybe sometime in the future, I might travel to Indonesia but what's the proposition for me learning this language right here and now? And so they want to see uh, value in it for their, their immediate life world, not just at some sort of um, you know, possible moment in the future. So I think we need to rethink the goals uh, of language education uh, and Indonesian can find a place within that. And obviously, uh, you know, complementing that within the whole curriculum, uh, the uh, perspectives, uh, Asian perspectives, um, with a good dose of Indonesian uh, within that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I think, you know, shifting the discourse, shifting the values proposition is really what, uh, you know, we, we're trying to do here, I think. Thanks very much, Michelle. I, I think you've also picked up on some of the, the, the many discussions and thoughts that we were throwing around um, on and when we first thought, well, maybe we need to try and speak to young people. But as you say, it's a very different proposition in speaking to young people. Uh, and that's why um, we think that could be the next step uh, in this journey. But this certainly feels like a good place to start in trying to get those messages out that actually speak to more than just the, the, the common things of something that might happen in the very distant future. Um, thanks, Michelle. Uh, Pak Sofyan, I'm going to um, come back to you again, um, really trying to talk about um, your, of course, your rich experience in the Australia uh, Indonesia Bridge Program, but your own uh, perspectives on what could more Indonesian and Australian schools do uh, by working in partnership uh, together? What, what's, what's your vision for how schools could work in partnership together uh, even more? Could you share your thoughts? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Hamis. I think so, uh, this partnership have give uh, many benefit for our, for our school, for our students, and for some uh, bridge school in Indonesia. And I think so, uh, to as your question is how to about my patients about this partnership is how to uh, give chance to another students to join in this part uh, in this uh, bridge partnership uh, I think it's not SMLM Mataram can participate in this bridge partnership yeah another school in Indonesia another school in Australia also we can join in this uh, bridge partnership because uh, there are so much benefit, yeah? Yeah, so, so much benefit that we can uh, take uh, from a bridge partnership. Um, maybe I, I give some example at my school. Uh, and some benefit that we can take uh, the process in contact for my school, yeah? Since the bridge is, was established in 2009, uh, our school become prestigious school in West Nusa Tenggara, yeah? We can implement new good practice in managing school environments that we adopt from uh, our school partner and and other bridge school. Yeah, more broadly through the lighthouse uh, lighthouse partnership status since 2019, we have been able to share this benefit not only to our entire school community but uh, also with other school in our province in West Nusa Tenggara Barat. Uh, Second, another contact of st my students, yeah, and our students by collaborative activities with students from our school partner, yeah, and other uh, bridge school in Indonesia, give them global perspective and some soft skill to be part of active global community. Uh, this uh, perspective and skill will open more opportunities 
our students to make greater contribution to the field that they choose later in their career. The, uh, the third is for our teachers, yes. Our teachers, they have chance to empower their capacity level things, yeah. Such uh, what I have uh, get from the bridge partnership, I have been a uh, workshop participant. And from some workshop that was facilitated by bridge partnership, I can, uh, my, my skills in, in teaching my students, uh, I, can, I can get some more input, something like that, maybe a hemis. Thank you very much, Pak Sofyan. Thank you for sharing some of those experiences and examples. And I think uh, it, it is about being able to come up with um, uh, different approaches and different ideas for how to sustain those partnerships. And again, you know, the work that you've been doing uh, has always persevered and persisted because we see the value in it. Uh, and that probably leads me to uh, my final question back to you, Andrew, uh, and then we might take a couple of uh, questions that have been sent in by some of our attendees. Um, but Andrew, of course, as a, as a principal, um, you know, we wanted this rationale to start to speak to uh, school leaders and those in, in school leadership around the country. How do you think uh, we can best get the message out to school leaders in Australia that knowing Indonesia is important to our future? Um, I think it's straightforward. Uh, Depto High School has a partnership with an Islamic boys boarding school. And when I tell my peer principals about that partnership, I find it passing odd. It's, it's a private school, we're a public school, etc., etc. Um, I think we have to persevere. Um, Maybe we, we, our COVID challenges might be giving us a lever. Um, I think face-to-face -face is so important, but uh, at Depto High School, Zoom, Zoom lessons, Zoom learning, connecting electronically, is just very ordinary at the moment. It's what everybody's got more skillful at and doing more of. So that might be, yesterday for the first time, I addressed every student and staff member via Zoom just because I needed to and we pulled it together in half an hour. So uh, just maybe we can use our, the technology that's now so freely available. When we talked to Eminem last night, technology in that college has improved dramatically since I was there three years ago. But I'd invite you to the Secondary Principals Conference 2022. It's in Wollongong. And I'm on the organising committee, so we'll run a session if you'd like. And I mean, for us, the Bri the AEF has been such a a fertile source of inspiration and connection. Um, I'm not exactly sure why some schools are so reluctant. Uh, Thanks, Andrew. Uh, look, at it. I think it's always about looking for platforms and network opportunities. Uh, and I think it's also um, finding, um, you know, voices who, like you, may not have um, a, 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 a situation where we teach the Indonesian language, but we see the value in it. And that's certainly something that um, we want to try and um, highlight through this rationale. Now, we've got um, a couple of minutes left uh, in this discussion to, to pick up on a couple of questions that come in. Uh, and given, um, I'm just looking at them here, actually, Michelle, given, given that um, you, you said the last one was easy, I'm going to hit you with something a little bit, a bit juicier. Um, because obviously one of the challenges is this, this rationale is about the why, it's, it's not the how, uh, which, which some have, have already given us that very clear feedback. And of course, how is some of those next steps? So one of the questions here is, you know, what, what changes in, in education policy do you believe might assist in then addressing the decline, but starting to do something about it. Um, you know, I know the education landscape is very complex in this space in Australia, but in your experience, what do you think are some of the levers that have to change if we're to uh, address this decline that we're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Hamish. <laughs> um, Look, I think there needs to be action on a number of fronts. Um, we've got the you know, micro level of the individual school and principals. 
um, and through notions of networks and, and so on. Um, we uh, also need policy reform um, at uh, both national and state levels, I would say, and those things need to be talking to each other. Um, we also need some structural reform, uh, and that is that we have some impediments uh, at different um, uh, junctures in schooling that are actually preventing uh, a sense of um, flow and connection and, and continuity for learning. Um, we also know that uh, particularly junior secondary is where what I call it, um, where numbers go over the cliff. And we need to have, I think, an intervention strategy at the junior secondary level. And some of that is related to um, where languages, not just Indonesian, but where languages and culture studies fits within the curriculum. And we actually, I think the, the biggest asset that we need in all of this is imagination. We need to imagine this space differently. We need to come up with some different models. Um, and uh, we've been doing some thinking here in our centre around that. Um, and we have worked with schools on initiating change and innovating. And there are ways to do it if you have the will and the imagination uh, and the commitment, because it is also something that requires long term change. We have to have uh, teacher supply. We need to look at teacher education differently. Why can't we have one in four teachers coming out of tertiary education, um, uh, tertiary education programs? having a language and then target a certain number to be of um, you know different languages so you know i think the levers are there we need some uh, momentum and maybe you know this this might be a part of moving the momentum in a positive direction uh, but certainly there are the levers uh, if we have the will Thank you, Michelle. You fielded that so well. Well done. That was a that was a great comprehensive response. Um, uh, Pax Sofia, we've had a we've had another question come in about why language learning is still important in this day and age. And I think when we look at uh, Indonesia and the enthusiasm from Indonesia in wanting to connect with Australia, wanting to develop those skills in in English, um, it's it's enormous the demand that we see. Um, could you tell us a little bit of, about why do you see language learning as important um, for your school? Okay, thank you. Yes, of course, uh, our student needs uh, uh, language as the, to support their uh, bright picture, especially about uh, how to learn uh, a foreign language, such English, yeah? Because when they can speak English fluently, that means they can go abroad for study to continue their study or abroad. And also maybe when one, when our student want to uh, have career in abroad, uh, foreign language English is uh, the key. Yes, and I know it's not just about uh, uh, English. Maybe uh, Australian students also need to to study Bahasa Indonesia, yeah? Because uh, as neighbors, yeah? Uh, Australian, maybe, uh, yeah, Indonesia, we can say that Indonesia is a very interesting place. And I know some of Australian, uh, Australian come to Indonesia, but when they come to Indonesia with a good English, I think it's uh, uh, some misunderstood may happen, yeah? But when they have a good Bahasa Indonesia, yeah, uh, they can communicate with uh, Indonesian people. That's mean that it's easy for them to understand each other. So uh, I, I'm as a uh, English teacher at my school. I always support my 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 student to to learn English, to have good speaking in English, because yeah, we know. They will uh, have some opportunities when they can speak English. Maybe something like that, I miss. But uh, why learn language is important, yeah? Thank you very much, Pak Sofyan. And I suppose it's a lovely point to make given uh, how well you've been responding uh, in, in English 
uh, throughout um, this this panel discussion. Uh, so your your English is also um, fantastic. Bagus sekali. <laughs> Terima kasih. <laughs> but I try by bridge uh, partnership. My I can practice my English. Yeah, we can have uh, some uh, good dialogue and conversation with our uh, uh, teacher partner in Malimambe High School. And this one of the benefit that we can take from uh, this partnership. And you, you know, maybe uh, some of Australian yeah will uh, interest to visit Lombok Island yeah because. And the next month we have uh, some international events such as uh, Superbike and also uh, in 2022 we have uh, uh, MotoGP. And that means, yeah, I, we know some Australians uh, love uh, MotoGP. That means they need good Indonesia uh, when they uh, visit uh, Lombok especially. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Let's find other ways to connect. Um, sport is always a great one. Good suggestion, Buck <laughs> Sofyan. Um, uh, Andrew, I'm going to give you the, the, the final word in this panel discussion. Uh, and, and really just about, you know, if there was one thing um, that you could wish for uh, as a school leader that would really help um, build the, the kind of uh, future you'd like to see for your uh, students in engaging um, with Indonesia, what, what would your wish be, Andrew? I'd like my various bosses to encourage me. In all these years, we've done our best, and it, well, it sounds a bit cruel, but I've, we've done it despite rather than because. We know that we need to have um, these perspectives in the national curriculum. We've agreed to it as a country, sustainability, indigenous, and Asian. But our engagement with Asia has cost us blood, sweat, and tears and some very passionate people have helped us. But in all these years, I don't think any of my bosses have ever said, excellent, well done, terrific, do some more. Um, anyway, mm. it, it, maybe this is the moment when th this sort of seminar and there's going to be some renewed, it's clear we need to work together. The climate change crisis, everywhere you look, we've got to be more, collaborate more and connect and connecting to Indonesia seems just so obvious. So, tell my bosses to start to push and shove, it's time. Wonderful, Andrew. I'm so glad you, you gave us that response because that also is the spirit of the rationale. We want it to be something that people can uh, take and forward on and hand to us and say, these are the reasons why. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, to Michelle, Andrew and, and Pak Sofyan for your time today and responding to those questions so well. There is of course more to come uh, from, from us uh, and from the AEF, including the release uh, in two weeks time of a comprehensive literature review that was conducted by uh, our own here, Dr. Michelle Collar for this rationale. So we hope you look forward to that. Once again, thank you to our panel. Thank you to our panel for a very informative and provocative set of reminders on why education should consider um, the role of Indonesian language um, and studies and their perspectives on the rationale itself. Um, thank you also for the great engagement from our participating attendees for, for the question and answers and also some uh, reflections that are coming out from the chat. It gives me um, a great pleasure now to invite our panel guests for today. Uh, Lydia Santoso. Lydia is a board member with the Australia Indonesia Institute, a council of Australian government department of foreign affairs and trade. She's also a solicitor with Nicholas George um, Lawyers. Lydia is sharing with us the significance of the rationale and the funding support uh, of AII in bringing this to life. Kepada Ibu Lydia, saya persilakan. Terima kasih, Asa. Hello, everybody. What a robust and uh, a great um, uh, conversation that we're having about this. And unfortunately, I've only got five minutes. I would love to uh, spend more time uh, on this, but um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be giving the closing remarks today on behalf of the AII. We are so proud to be supporting this project and publication. And in a sense, it's been quite long overdue. So I'm glad that we are finally here and it's being launched. 
We all know about the dire state of Bahasa in Indonesian schools, the drastic decline in the number of students taking on Bahasa or Indonesian studies. The challenges, you know, some were highlighted by Andrew today, and thank you, Andrew, for your honesty. The AI, the AII saw a need to do something about it, and we saw the need to showcase and highlight the modern and contemporary Indonesia, whilst at the same time not to disrespect age-old traditions and culture. And so this is what this document is all about. It's about sparking that interest, starting that conversation, that aha moment. And with this visually stunning document, I mean, it's just beautiful. I'm certain that it will peak interest and it will start those conversations and, you know, the references to the facts, the stories, the information, it showcases a new and fresh perspective of Indonesia and, you know, it will forge that people to people connection even more. At the AAI, the people to people connection is central to what we do. We have focused a number of our flagship programs towards the youth engagement, and it's been so lovely to hear uh, so many of our programs being mentioned today. So it's great to know that uh, it is known out there and, and um, recognised. We have obviously the AYAP program, the exchange program, the MEP program, the Australian Indonesian Muslim Exchange program. Bridge, which is obviously one of our most important um, programs connecting the schools between Australia and Indonesia and wonderful to have Pat Sofian and Andrew here today. And we've also have our brand new program of the AAI Indonesian Studies Awards, which launched earlier this month. So this publication sits extremely well within the context of our programs, of our work, and it's very complimentary. However, having said that, it is alarming to read that one of the research, um, latest researchers on the state of Indonesian um, and student drop off is as a result of xenophobia stemming from the limited understanding and negative perceptions. This just shows that our work here is not done and it motivates me even more than anything to do more to change those perceptions. But, you know, I can't do it alone. It requires effort from all fronts. and a multifaceted approach from government, the you know, education departments, the private sector, and not just here in Australia, but in both countries. We, you know, for example, we need more Indonesian teachers. Um, and I believe the time, you know, is now is ripe with the newly implemented ISEPA in place. Surely we can work out some way to overcome these challenges that, you know, Michelle have, has brought up as well. And, you know, uh, very well, uh, you know, cases in point where, We've got the landscape uh, is ripe, it's here. We need to take advantage of this. And it's like a ripple effect, you know, it touches so many sectors and, um, and obviously soft diplomacy as well uh, in the form of, uh, of, of the government. And Her Excellency, um, Ms. Penny Williams and how lucky we are to have her uh, stationed up in Jakarta mentioned uh, today that 1.3 million Aussies go to holiday in Bali. Now imagine if, 5%, 10% of those who travel up to Indonesia on holidays, you know, learned Indonesian or picked up the language or took that extra step and, and got to know more about Indonesia and its culture. I mean, you know, all of the opportunities are there, but we just need to break through uh, that barrier and, and take it to the next level. Whilst the overall picture can seem bleak, we do have glimmers of hope and brilliant success stories, the bridge program, for instance, and, you know, very inspiring to hear from uh, Andrew and Pat Sofia and of how, you know, bridge has made a, a difference in their schools. Uh, IAP, for example, has been running for 39 years, you know, imagine the alumni uh, from that, the government's new Colombo plan. We now have set up ballet bahasas uh, across the states and the territories uh, in, in Australia. And also in New South Wales, we have our first bilingual Indonesian uh, school at Scott's Head Public School. Now, wouldn't it be great to have a bilingual high school? Um, you know, that could be next on the, on the agenda. But now with the travel restrictions lifting and both countries coming out of the pandemic, we are close to being able to travel again, um, you know, in the near future and, and resume those uh, people to people connections. And I guess, uh, you know, the what we've learned from the pandemic is that di digital, the digital world and that digital connection and the students within that digital um, age, uh, I think that's something that we could uh, learn from um, and take with us into the future. 
I'd like to congratulate Hamish and the whole team at the AEF for producing this wonderful publication. And I guess in closing, and I, I, you know, I'm conscious of the time, but um, I'd like to put out a call to arms, so to speak. You know, we here on this uh, uh, webinar are all stakeholders in this space. And so I urge you to use this publication and to take it to the next step. Uh, you know, ask yourself, what can I do in my day to day life or in my job, uh, you know, where I can change those misconceptions about Indonesia uh, and promote the study of the language and foster a better and deeper connection. So thank you again for allowing me this opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Lydia, for those thoughtful and um, powerful reminders on the work of the Australia Indonesia Institute and the reasons why these initiatives and efforts are so deeply important. So we're, we're very grateful for all the support from the AII. We would like to give our sincere thanks to the hundreds of people who gave their time and experience into the shaping of the rationale. To our distinguished guests today who have joined us to give voice to the rationale, particularly Her Excellency Ms. Penny Williams, thank you so very much for your ongoing work and advocacy. To the Australia Indonesia Institute, thank you for the ongoing support in the development of the rationale. We'd also like to uh, acknowledge our thanks to Mira Chakratmaja by, by Mira Design, who is Indonesian and living in Melbourne to her wonderful layout and illustration for the rationale. I've heard many comments about our virtual backgrounds today and that's designed by Mira. At the close of this Zoom, uh, you will receive a link to complete a short two-point survey um, to gather your feedback on the launch event. Sekali lagi, terima kasih banyak. Thank you very much. We would like um, you to enjoy a short video as closing, highlighting some of the wonderful experiences uh, of education through Indonesian language and studies. Terima kasih. Sampai jumpa.